thank you so much for coming out tonight for this talk. Before I get into the uh, meat of the material, I'd like to recognize and introduce my very special guest, my nephew, Charles B. Wilkerson III, who is fresh from the wars of Texas politics with the bruises and scars to, to prove it. Um, and he's also, as someone mentioned, he may be here to fact check me as well. So we'll see how that goes. I want to start by <clears throat> just briefly mentioning American politics because in spite of what you heard, Texas is actually part of the United States of America. And while uh, its relationship with the rest of the country has been touchy at times, there is a relationship there. And this is a very brief, and I'm just going to scroll through this very quickly, a very brief introduction to the kind of conventional breakdown of American politics. And you see up here that there's the, the founding political party system with Jefferson's Democratic Republicans and Alexander Hamilton's Federalists. And essentially, the, at the very beginning, the Jeffersonians saw that, believed that job one of the federal government was to serve the interests of their constituency, which is essentially uh, uh, consisted of leave us alone, because they represented people who needed, in order to prosper, they needed X number of hours of uh, sunshine per month and X number of inches of rain per year, and there wasn't much the federal government could do to help them with that. The Federalists, who were trying to, to jumpstart a capitalist industrial economy, needed lots of intervention, and they thought job one of the federal government was <clears throat> business prosperity and economic growth. Well, by the time we get down here to our own time into the 21st century, both parties, really sorry to break it to some of you, believe that, jo that job one of the federal government is business prosperity and economic growth. There are still some divisions about how best to obtain that and who the central constituency is. For example, if Jefferson's, if the normal ordinary American in the 1790s was a farmer, if we go to our own time, the nation's largest um, employer is Walmart. So where farmers might have, ne might have needed government to leave them alone, maybe that Walmart employees might have a somewhat different take on what government might be able to do for them. On the other side, the Hamiltonians, <coughs> As I used to teach it, once cap industrial capitalism becomes robust and powerful and uh, dominant, it doesn't need the tender attentions of a nurturing federal government. And I taught that right up until 2008. And then I had to toss that lecture and explain that sometimes industrial capitalism also needs the tender nurturing care once more of the federal government. So this is, let me just roll through this very quickly. Um, they got married or sort of shacked up together actually in the 18 teens. They couldn't stay together because they disagreed on everything. The next one is when um, Andrew Jackson comes along and <clears throat> his opponents disagreed with him so much that they formed a, the Hamiltonian split off and reformed a separate party. The third party system of course was interrupted by the Civil War and it has some interesting effects on the South, which we'll get to a little bit later on. The fourth party system is where it starts to get interesting, so that there is the National Democratic Party, but then there are, are the Southern Democrats who will not vote for the Republican Party in, in elections, but whose candidates behave more or less like Republicans once they reach Washington, D.C. This continues the, the, the Great Depression New Deal um, interlude interrupts that, so there's a little, a little twist into that a bit, which we'll get into later. <clears throat> and finally, political scientists and political historians debate whether or not we're in the sixth party system or if we're entered into a seventh. This is all abstractions and you can, you're free to arrive at your own conclusion. <clears throat> but essentially what happens after the civil rights movement is that the conservative Southern whites who've been voting for their reliably conservative Southern Democrats began to find it in their hearts after the interstate highway system, the invention of air conditioning, and the influx of northern immigrants to begin to vote for um, Republicans. But uh, more about that later on. There's the whole picture once more. And I need to go back. And I wonder how I can do that. Let's try that. 
a much more simplified version of what I've been talking about is right here. So on the other, on one side, you see Jefferson's Democratic Republicans go through one name change under Jackson and Van Buren. And so that's the Democratic Party of today, the, the party of Andrew and Jesse Jackson. On the other hand, they've had a tougher time settling on a single name. What destroyed the Whigs was it because it, as it represented the most well-off, best educated Americans. In the North, those people turned against slavery. In the South, those were the slave owners. They can't continue that party. So as soon as uh, the question of Western expansion of slavery comes around, the Whig party must split. The Southern Whigs are homeless, not long. We'll tell you where they went. And the Northern Republicans found a new party, which is the party of Seward, Lincoln, and Reagan Bush. Welcome to Texas, where things sometimes get a little topsy-turvy. The point of this discussion, which is going to be very brief, is that Texas has never been a two-party state. Since we've been keeping account of election returns, only in a handful of elections have two major parties actually have they been competitive. In most elections, we see something very similar to what we saw the day before yesterday. A very a lopsided, decisive victory for one party. And in most elections throughout Texas history, especially from the post-Civil War period where it starts to resemble the contemporary era now for us to make sensible comparisons, Texas political culture has been decidedly right of center. So sometimes, in other words, conservatives win statewide elections in Texas. During the period when conservatives ran under the Democratic Party label, they won. When changes in the mid 20th century began to shake up the constituencies, demographics, and membership of the two political parties, the Texas electorate began to vote for conservative Republicans. But, there's no, but there has not been some kind of sea change in Texas politics. The story of Texas politics is one of continuity for the last 150 years. Let me just see if I can illustrate this a couple of places. First of all, the Civil War. And I just met some new friends here from New England. And one thing about New Englanders is it, pardon me, y'all forgot about the Civil War because the, and the reason for forgetting is because the expected happened. And if you're praying for victory and God smiles on your cause and you win, that makes sense to your worldview and you move on. And you don't see 25-year-old pickup trucks cruising around Massachusetts today with Union battle flags as bumper stickers. On the other hand, an equally pietistic people, Southerners, prayed for victory, had public days of fasting, and they got their butts handed to them by the Union. That hurt their feelings. What on earth happened here? Plus just simply the slaughter. One out of 20 white men between the ages of 15 and 50 in the South died in the Civil War. That's a lot of bereavement. That's a lot of hurt feelings within families, dead uncles, husbands, brothers, daddies. And they viewed their, the, the people who killed their grandpa at Gettysburg, the one thing they knew about them was that they were fighting for Abraham Lincoln and his party was which party? The Republican Party. So they can't vote for that party. And in the South, from Texas all the way to the Atlantic coast, Republicans could not win amongst white Southern voters. So remember I talked, mentioned just briefly homeless Southern Whigs? I said after the Whig Party broke up, the Southern Whigs were homeless, but not for long. These are the most powerful, well-educated, wealthy, influential people in the South. 
so they're not going to be homeless for long. They look around, they see which party can win amongst the great unwashed masses of Southerners, i.e. the majority, and they simply take over that party. So consequently, by the 1870s, there are two Democratic parties. There's the National Democratic Party, which was on a one trajectory headed in a particular direction, and there was the Southern Democratic Party who ran as the party of the South when, the, when campaigning. I know it's shocking to think that perhaps some people sound different during a campaign than once they get elected, but once they're elected and sent to Washington, tended to vote with the Northern Republicans with whom they actually agree on most of the fiscal issues of the, of the day, which leads me to this bumper sticker I grew up with seeing across the state, and I translated it for you. When you saw a bumper sticker in the 1960s and 70s and even into the 1980s in Texas, it said, Texas Democrat, the subtext of that was, trust me, not really, okay? So we have to run as Democrats, but we're really conservative. So <clears throat> that gets me to uh, an example. One of the most famous practitioners of this, who actually lent his name to a kind of humorous recasting of the Democratic Party was Alan Shivers, who <clears throat> um, celebrated the fact that his followers were shivercrats, not Democrats. And he publicly endorsed the Republican candidate for president in 1952 and again in 1956, while himself winning re-election as a Democrat, but as a Texas Democrat, which means not really, okay? Well, so keep that in mind, and then I want you to look at some interesting, well, one last thing. The, the, the crisis comes, as we recently commemorated here in this conference center, the 1964 signing of the, the Civil Rights Act, and also the 1965 signing of the Voting Rights Act, and the most liberal president the country had ever had was, irony of ironies, a Texas Democrat. Except in his case, really, okay, really. <clears throat> Although, as a good politician, he was not above coming back to Texas and saying things that would try to get, reassure his people that he's really still a good old, not really, Texas Democrat. And he said famously when he backed the Civil Rights Movement that I have just cost the Democratic Party the white Southern vote for a generation. Well, let's see, what's it been? Three generations, almost, and counting. So I think he was a little optimistic on that score. So from the 60s, from mid 60s on, when a Republican in the 1964 presidential election, the party of Lincoln, the Yankee Republicans, their presidential candidate got 90% of the white Mississippian vote. Shall I repeat that? What I'm suggesting is that that's a critical election that shows formerly solid, predictable Democrats voters jumping the fence in what becomes a permanent realignment in Southern politics. It takes a while for it to shake itself out. For whatever reason, Texas is one of the last of the Southern states to kind of make this transition. But from the 1970s on, we start seeing prominent Democrats beginning to publicly take off their blue jackets and put on their red jackets. Here are four you might know. There were lots of them, but I tried to limit it here. I'm sure you've heard, some of us at least, have heard of Phil Graham. There may be a couple here who weren't born when he left office, but you heard of Senator Graham, was a United States congressman elected from Central Texas running as a Democrat. And when he believed that the time had come to change his affiliation, he did so. John Connolly, famously wounded in the mo motorcade with Kennedy in 63 in Dallas. Incidentally, what was Kennedy doing in Dallas in 63? 
trying to bridge this growing chasm between the Democrats in Texas and the Texas, not really, Democrats. Everything went well until they invited him to take a little ride down Elm Street. Is it too soon? Yeah. Connolly eventually in the 70s will switch over to the Republican Party. Uh, Rick Perry does it in the 1980s. His first runs for political office were as a Democrat. And um, closer to home, it took quite a while longer. It wasn't until the early 2000s that um, longtime Democrat Ralph Hall, longtime Texas Democrat, Ralph Hall switches to the Republican Party. But uh, here's the, the next thing I want to bring to your attention. When I say never a two-party state, what I mean is that outside of a few transitional elections, Texas politics are rarely, if ever, competitive. Starting in 1920, at this end you see, and I just chose representative elections because at first the gubernatorial elections were happening every two years and that graph would have been really messy to look at. But here are some, I tried to do it at the decade mark until it became impossible to do so. But here from 1920 to 1970, you see the, how well above the 50% line the Democrats are. And each one of these candidates that were, was elected or re-elected in these elections were Texas conservative Democrats. <clears throat> so the only thing that changes here is the color of the graph. The policies pursued from 1920 through 1970 are not rejected afterwards. They're, they continue to be affirmed because the, the victorious candidates in the prior to 1970 were conservative Democrats and the victorious candidates afterwards were conservative Republicans. I know that your <coughs> election of 1990 is Ann Richards and I just left it out for the sake of continuity. She was had Clayton Williams had sense enough to shake her hand then she probably would not have been elected in that particular election. It didn't change anything. It was during this transitional period. She sounded wonderfully country in Texas and because she was seen as being uh, treated in an ungentlemanly fashion by the boorish Clayton Williams. That was a special, that was a unique election. It doesn't tell us anything about the trend. Here's where you see I think the trend which is Republicans winning after 1978 78 um, is close, granted, right? But thereafter becomes more and more uh, decisive. And there's something I couldn't figure out how to graph, so I just want to tell you that one of the puzzles about talking about Texas politics, and I hate to even say it like this because it's going to sound like Texas chauvinism, but this is just an accident of history. Texas is big as states in the United States go, and has a variety of climates, which has produced a variety of, ec of economies, which produces a variety of subcultures. And so here's what I found Wednesday morning when looking at the county by county breakdown. <clears throat> if you look at the, the shape of Texas, and someone recently said, why do you love Texas? Well, first of all, I'm seventh generation Texan. Where am I gonna go? <coughs> They won't take me anywhere else. They think I talk funny. But the other thing I love about Texas is the shape. That six point burst, you know, that the cartographers came up with. So if you start in the northeastern corner in Bowie County, Texarkana, and you go up into the panhandle to Dallum County, the top northwestern corner, those two counties voted for Abbott 70 something percent to 20 something percent for Davis. Then if you go to El Paso County, the other far western tip star, and then down to the bottom of the star, Cameron County, those two counties voted for, did I say Davis or Abbott? 
I said Abbott, good. Those two, the El Paso and Cameron voted for Wendy Davis 70 plus percent to 20 something percent for the Republican. So you understand that there's a problem in talking about Texas. There are a number of Texas, this is as explained by my favorite character in the movie Bernie. Remember him? There's about five places in Texas and he shows you the map and, and where are we? We're in Stobakistan up here around Dallas. So there are regional variations and I think there, that, those are, that those may suggest something important in the long run. It's too early to know exactly what that is, but one of the reasons that Cameron County and El Paso County and Bayer County and those other counties were, went so strongly for Davis is because of the increasing strength of the Hispanic population in the southern half of the state. So that's, that's for the, well, the future will tell us what that means. But the main point of this right here is to show you how big the governing party wins. For most of Texas history, it has not, except for this middle transitional period in the 1970s, it's never been a two-party state. And the second point I'd like to make is that it didn't switch ideologies. It was conservative under the Texas Democrats and it's conservative under the Texas Republicans. One last point, which I just gave away. <laughs> Yeah, it's really difficult being this visually impaired. <clears throat> One last point. We don't have any idea what Texans believe because they don't vote. Since we've been keeping regular count of uh, presidential election participation, you can divide the elections of Texas into before the poll tax, and after the poll tax. I think I can bring that back up here. Thank you. Now, it's the last slide, the very last one. There you go. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was pretending like I knew how to use PowerPoint, but <laughs> we're, we're, we're out in the open now. Uh, thank you, Vernon, for recording all of this. <laughs> Before, between 1872, when, when the first valid post-Civil War records were being kept, all the way up to 1900, <clears throat> around two-thirds of Texans voted that were able to vote. And I'm not talking about this uh, redefinition. More recently, journalists have been talking about turnout and they don't buy that they're inflating the numbers by turnout they mean the percentage of registered voters who actually voted that's not what these pie charts reveal this is a percentage of people eligible by law to vote so in the first case it's it's um, males over the age of 21 and eventually after 1920 includes women <clears throat> but in, in, from 1872 to 1900, the average voter turnout in presidential election years was two-thirds of the, of the electorate, two-thirds. In 1896, almost 80 percent of Texans who were qualified to vote by gender and age went to the polls and voted. But there was a problem. They voted for the wrong guy. And the people who ran Texas politics, said, we can't let this happen anymore. Those people, those ignorant, unwashed masses, scare the pants off of us. Let's curtail their access to the ballot. So they wrote a poll tax which said, you gotta pay to vote. And they managed to cut the Texas electorate in half. So from 1902 going forward, politicians only had to worry about appealing to writing policies that represented the interests of the top half of the electorate in terms of economics. What was the result? 
a complete inversion of voting. When the poor majority said, uh, is it really worth the poll tax? Can I get, really get these if I'm the only one in my community or neighborhood who comes up with the money to, to vote? Will it make a difference? What developed is not apathy. There's a cartoon went around Texas newspapers recently accusing Texas voters of apathy. There is a difference between apathy, I don't care, and a long-term intergenerational culture of despair. And that's what you see here. Even after the poll tax was outlawed in 1964, laws can be changed like that, culture's not so fast. The people who still had never seen their parents vote continued to stay away from the polls in droves. So when pundits tell us what this recent election meant, we should temper that with this additional knowledge. We have no idea what Texans believe or want or wish from government because they don't vote and they haven't voted for a hundred years and it, the best year 1992 was 48 percent but we have seen participation levels as low as 20 20s 30s uh, a good year is 48 percent but you see the difference don't you that's still the top half which may explain something about the other graphs that I've been showing you up until this time. Thank you again for rescuing the, the slides. That's my prepared remarks, as if. I would really like to take questions and answer heckling from the floor. <laughs>